I want to start by telling you what a privilege it is to be able to come to you to speak to you about spiritual things. Thank you for this opportunity. I am a Gideon, which we are, I'm one of those people, and, and uh, me and Dave, we're one of those people that uh, put Bibles in hotels, and uh, we're, Gideons do that all over the world in over 200 countries. We do that in hopes that someone will pick up that Bible who doesn't know Christ, be able to read God's Word and be saved. We do Bible distributions. We did one a couple weeks ago on Ferris State University campus. And we gave away 1,160 Bibles to students on campus. We did that in hopes that somehow they would read that Bible and be led to Christ. We believe and we have the heart of the heart of an evangelist, which means we want to tell people about Christ and lead them to Christ in some way. That's what I want to speak to you about today, is just that. I want you to turn to John chapter 4, verse 35. And in John chapter 4, verse 35, we have Jesus speaking to his disciples. He's speaking to his disciples. And he's telling them, it says, Say not ye, there are yet four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look upon the fields, for they are white and ready to harvest. And he that reaps receives wages and gathers fruit unto the life eternal, that both he that sows and he that reaps may rejoice together. Wherein is the saying true, one sows and other reaps. I send you to reap, whereupon you bestowed no labor, other men's labor, you are entered into their labor. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He tells them that there's four months till the natural, physical harvest. He's telling them that the harvest isn't quite ready in the natural, but he tells them to look upon the fields, for the fields are white and ready to harvest. He's telling them the harvest is ready, and it's ready right now. He tells them in verse 36, he says, He that sows and he that reaps re may rejoice together, because they're working together with God to do such a thing. He tells the disciples, I sent you to reap where you bestowed no labor, other men's labor, you are entered into their labor. I believe that is for us that when we begin to speak to somebody that we care about and tell them about Jesus in some possible way, I believe we all have someone who we want to lead to Christ, somebody that we look upon and we have, we have compassion on them because we know they're not saved, we know they're hurting, whether they be friends or relatives, children, grandchildren, nephews, nieces, cousins, whether they be somebody that you work with, associate at work, whether they be somebody you see at the grocery store, the lady, at the gas station. Anybody that you see, you have compassion on them and you know they're not saved, you hurt for them, just like Jesus did, and just like what he's talking about. He says, you bestow labor where you haven't, he says, I send you to reap where you did not labor. He's telling us that we're going to talk to people about Jesus, and there have already been somebody there before us. They've already laid the groundwork. They've already told them things about Jesus. They already have seeds of faith planted in them that they're holding on to. And then we can come along and talk to them about Jesus in some way, in some way, and lead them to Christ. That's what he's telling his disciples, but he's telling us also the same thing. I want you to turn to John chapter 4, verse 6. And in John chapter 4, verse 6, Jesus is taught, this is about the woman at the well. We've all heard the story about the woman at the well, where Jesus leads the woman at the well, begins to speak to her about spiritual things. 
She believes in Jesus, goes and tells her friends, her, her, the people that she knows about Jesus. They come to see Jesus, listen to what he says, and they also believe. But I believe there's much more to this than that. I think that Jesus is showing us the dynamic of a one-on-one -on -one situation where one person speaks to one person. They look upon the person with compassion. They care so much about them that they put themselves out there and, they're, and they care so much that they're willing to fail. But they'll go out there and speak to them from their heart, telling them whether it's their testimony and how they came to Christ, whether it is how much Jesus means to them. No matter what it is, they're telling him these things to help lead them to Christ in some way. And I believe that's what we do when we look upon the people that are unsaved. Jesus is showing us this example. This one-on-one -on -one dynamic is so incredible because it shows the love for one person for another. More people come to Christ that way than any other way. And that's why we're speaking today. In verse 4 it says, I'm sorry, in verse 6 it says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It was about noon. And there comes a woman of Samaria, Samaria and draws water. Jesus says to her, give me to drink. Jesus' intent from the very beginning was to get into a conversation, a spiritual conversation with her so he could lead her to the kingdom of God. She doesn't know it. He's speaking about natural things about the well, and there they're sitting there. He says, give me to drink. She comes back and says, or in verse 8 it says, for the disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. And then the woman says unto him, the woman of Samaria says unto him, how is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which is a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus says to her, give me to drink. She says, why are you even speaking to me? I'm a woman from Samaria. The Jews don't even have dealings with the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a mixture of different nations. They were the people there were, many of them had married Jews, but they weren't considered pure. The Jews did not like them. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. This woman knew that. She's saying to Jesus, why are you speaking to me? You're a Jew. She's not helping Jesus in his conversation with her by by promoting the conversation or going along with him, she's trying to shut Jesus down and telling him that she's not interested. This is the same dynamic that people do when we want to tell them about Jesus in some way. We tell them a spiritual thing. They may tell us, I'm not interested. They may be negative, just like this woman is with Jesus. What does Jesus do? Jesus tells her, verse 10, Jesus answered and says unto her, If thou knew the gift of God and who it was that says unto thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would give her living water. The woman says to Jesus, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, the well is deep, from hence thou hast thou that living water. Are you greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? She's still not cooperating with Jesus. Jesus continued to go on. She's not cooperating. She says, who do you think you are? You didn't even have anything to draw with. Why are you talking about this living water? Jesus sets the example for us. He continues. He begins to speak to her about this living water. He begins to speak to her about the Spirit of God. In verse 16, Jesus says to her, go, call thy husband, and have him come here. The woman answers and says, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and the one whom you are with now is not your husband. Jesus talks to her, tells her, then I know what's going on in your life. You've had five, five husbands, life has been hard for you. He's not telling her that she's some kind of prostitute, that she's with all these different men. She's saying, you've had five husbands. In the course of your life, your life has been tough. It's been very hard. This woman's been through a lot. She's had five husbands. It's been hard. She says, verse 17, 
verse 16. Oh, excuse me. She says, verse 19. The woman says unto him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Now, when we're talking to somebody about spiritual things, we don't always know what it is that they're t that's going on in their life. We don't always understand what they're going through. We could get a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. We could get divine intervention. But what we're supposed to do, and we're supposed to tell them about Jesus in some way, how they can be saved, how they can be helped, how Jesus can help them just like he did us. In verse 25, the woman says unto, unto him, I know the Messiah comes, which is called the Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus says to her, I that speak unto thee am he. The woman begins, and, and here we have an example of what we want to take place when we're talking to somebody about Jesus. What we want them to do, tell us is about the things in their life, what they know spiritually. We want them to tell us where they're at and what they believe and where we should continue from there. The woman, Jesus, gave her a chance to talk about herself and about the things she knew. She begins to talk about the spiritual things she knows about. And that's when Jesus reveals himself to her. But she does know some spiritual things. And in verse 38, when it said, I send you to reap where upon you bestowed no labor, other men's labor you are entered in. This is an example of what takes place. Someone has been there before this. Somebody's told them spiritual things. The people that you speak to about Jesus will know spiritual things because someone has been there. You're entering into somebody else's labor. And you can reap a harvest. You can bring them to Christ because of that. And this is a perfect example of that. She says, and Jesus says to her that he is, it is he, he's the Messiah. She gets so excited. She's so happy to hear it. After all that conversation, all those things that took place, the woman, verse 28, it says, the woman left her water pot and went her way into the city and said unto the men, come and see the man which told me all things I ever did. Is not this the Christ? She's so excited she leaves her water pot. She, she goes and tells the people, her people that she knows, that this is the Christ, I've met him. And good came of that because they met to, went to so see Jesus. They wanted to see what was going on because they believed what she had to say. In verse 42, this is what the men, this is what the people who she went and told about Jesus to. This is what they said. They said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. This is a perfect example of what we can expect when we tell somebody about Jesus. We can expect them to accept Jesus. We can expect them to tell others because they're so excited about what took place. When we became a Christian, we did the same thing. We were so excited we wanted to tell somebody, and that's exactly what takes place with the woman at the well. She leaves her pot. She comes and tells her people. They want to come to find out because they believe what she said. And then they come to see Jesus and they believe for themselves. I want you to turn to Matthew, chapter 9, verse 35. And John, after he meets the, meets the woman in the well, he tells his disciples that the fields are ripe, the fields are ready, that the grain and the fruit has changed color, that it's white and the harvest is ready. In Matthew 39, 35, Jesus went about the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus went about doing what he does, teaching and healing. And when he saw the multitudes, he looked upon them with compassion. I believe this is in here so that we can look upon this today. 
when Matthew wrote this years after this actually took place, it was written so we could read this and understand. That we're to look on people with compassion, the ones who are unsaved, the people that we care about, the people that we love. We look and see them. We hurt for them because we know what they're going through. He says that they fainted, which means they grew weary because of their mundane lives, because of what they go through every day. The things that they have, how weary life is, not knowing the Savior, not understanding what direction they should be in in life. They're hurting. Jesus looks on them, sees them, feels for them, wants to tell them and teach them and, how to, and bring them to him. He wants to save those people. In verse 37, it says, And then Jesus said unto his disciples, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers unto his harvest. Just like in John, he doesn't tell his disciples, pray for those poor people that are lost. Pray for those people that they would come to me. He tells them that the fields are white and ready for harvest now. Just like in Matthew, he says, for the harvest is truly plenteous. It's a big harvest and it's ready. He says, but pray to the Lord that he would send forth laborers unto his harvest. I believe we are to pray for ourselves and to pray for laborers unto the, his harvest. That it's his, his harvest, his harvest is ready. We need to believe that because that's what it says. He wants us to pray for ourselves that we become those laborers in the harvest. I believe that he is not any willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance. I believe that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, that it's already done, it's already happened. All we have to do is convince people, and just like we did, we accepted Jesus, and that was what, what took place, because we have changed our mind, because he already did it, it's already done. We need to remember that, think about that, realize that when we're speaking to others about him, because that's what he wants us to do. 95% of Christians Actually, it's 95 to 97 percent of Christians have never led anyone to Christ. It's hard to believe that. But any statistics that I've ever read, it's almost the same thing. Most Christians do not lead anyone to Christ. 75 percent of people come to Christ in a one-on-one -on -one situation where one person is speaking to another person, just like Jesus showed us with the woman at the well. Where you look on the person with compassion, you want to help them in some way. You tell them about how you were saved. You tell them your personal testimony. You tell them what it is to be near Jesus and know who he is. You want to tell these people that, and that's why, that's why Jesus said, I pray to the Lord of the harvest that he'll send forth laborers because most people don't lead anyone to Christ. But 75% go to turn to Christ because if somebody tells them, because if somebody has compassion, tells them one-on-one. -on -one. It's that one-on-one -on -one dynamic where one person is speaking to another person where it becomes so meaningful and so incredibly true that when they hear the words of, of truth and they hear about Jesus, they want to accept it because they know that it's true. Because they're hearing you speak it one-on-one -on -one and they believe that. 17% of people come to Christ because of an event where you bring someone into church or it's a tent meeting or a crusade where you can actually bring somebody here to this event and you can bring them to the pastor and say, Pastor, they're not saved. Can you do something about it? And he will. He will do what he can. But it's better off that, what, that we lead someone to Christ, somebody that we know, somebody that we care about. We look at them, look into their eyes and tell them and show them the, the compassion that we have for them and that we actually love them and care for them. We wonder why 95 to 97% of Christians never lead anyone to Christ. It's because they don't, much of the time is they don't know how. If you don't know how to lead someone to Christ, how, what are you going to do? What are you going to say? You could do well like Jesus did. You can take in something that's in the natural, like the well and the water, and you can turn it into something spiritual. That's what we're to do. Jesus set that example and showed us and told us. 
That's a perfect example of how to do it. Many people don't have the opportunity to lead someone to Christ. Or they, they, don't, have the, they don't have the burden for the lost. We're going to pray for that burden. We're going to pray for that compassion. We're going to pray for that today because Jesus told us to. He said to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. We're going to pray that we're the, we're, we are the laborers in his harvest. But most of the time people don't lead someone to Christ because of fear. It's fear of speaking to somebody. It's fear of conf the confrontation. It's the fear of, 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 of not, uh, it's, it's the fear of failure. It's the fear of failure. What, happen if it's, what happens if it doesn't work out? What happens if they don't like me? What happens if, if they ridicule me and, and, and think that I'm some kind of a nut because I'm telling them about Jesus? It's the fear. Well, when we pray for compassion, I believe that God is going to help us. We're going to pray for compassion. We're going to have a burden for the loss. And I believe that what's going to take place is our burden is going to be so strong that it's going to overpower the fear that we have about speaking to others about Jesus. We're going to believe that. We're going to hope for that. And we're going to expect that because that's what he wants us to do. What Jesus did when his disciples, he sent them out. And he sent them out, and this is what he told them. He said, as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He said, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. He sent out his disciples, gave them instructions. Sent them out two by two because he knew they were afraid. He knew they were scared. He knew they, they needed help. And he knew that they needed support and they could help one another. One could be praying, one could be speaking. They both could be praying, they both could be speaking. But to do it alone is pretty hard. He knew that and he did that. He sent them out two by two. Just like he sent the 70 out, he had 70 other disciples he sent out, he sent them out two by two, knowing they needed help and support. He sent them out, they came back and they said, even the, de even the devils are subject unto us. And Jesus says, don't rejoice in that. He says, rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. He says, rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. Rejoice that you are saved. That's what we need to do. We need to think about how powerful it is and how powerful he is and what happened to us. The most incredible thing happened to us. We got saved because of him. We need to tell people that. We need to let that be known. Jesus said, be happy in in." And rejoice because your names are written down in heaven. What do we say? What do we say to a person that doesn't know Christ? Well, Jesus gave us some examples. Take a natural thing, turn it into a soup, something spiritual. Begin to speak about that. Jesus said, He says, I am the door. If any man enters in, he shall be saved. He says, I am the door. It's Jesus. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. There's no possible way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, he says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It's always about Jesus. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, he spoke to her about him. He talked about the Spirit of God being the living water. He talked about him, that he was the Savior. He was the Messiah. We can't say that, but we are to send, we are to, to point to Jesus. We are to say, this is Jesus. He's the one. There's no possible other way except for him. I believe that the 95 to 97% of the people who, have never lead, who are Christians who have never led anyone to Christ are seed planters. I believe that God uses us to plant seeds in people, seeds of faith, telling them something about Jesus they're going to hold on to, something that they won't forget about, something that will help grow their faith. In 1 Corinthians 3, 6, the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, and he says, I have watered Apollos, I'm sorry, he says, I have planted Apollos is watered, but God gives the increase. 
He says, I have planted the seeds of faith in them by speaking to them about Jesus. I said something to them about Jesus. They began to believe that, and that seed of faith grew in them. Along comes Apollos. He says, Apollos watered. He didn't water. Apollos preached and taught and helped their faith grow, and so that their faith could grow in Jesus. It says, but God gives the increase because we can't. It's God's faith. It's his. We can't save anybody. All we can say is that's Jesus. This is what Jesus did for me. This is Jesus. There's no other way. 7.6. It takes 7.6 times for a person to hear the gospel before they'll accept it. That's the average amount of times a person hears the gospel before they accept it. Most people don't accept it the first time they hear it. That's almost eight times they have to hear it, the average person, some more, some less. There's so many times that we have to hear it because we don't understand it, we don't know what it means, because the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. It's foolishness to him. So we have to tell them, we have to say things. It's up to us to plant seeds of faith in them by telling them something. We can tell them anything we want. We can say, Jesus loves you so much, he wants to save you. We can say, just pray to Jesus right now. Just talk to him just like you're talking to me. Pray to him, speak to him, speak to Jesus. We need to get something in them, something so they begin to believe. We need to tell them, because if they can't accept Christ, they need the seeds of faith so that eventually they will, and somebody will come along and enter into your labor and lead them to Christ. In Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go ye into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's us, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. There's a lot of things they need to know. There's a lot of spiritual things that you can plant seeds of faith into people. In Acts 1, 8, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. God gives us the power to be witnesses. He gives us the power so we can speak to other people. He's asking us to do so. This is the uttermost parts of the earth. This is big rapids, the uttermost parts of the earth. That's it. This is us. This is where we are. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. We are laborers together with God. Do you believe that? <laughs> it's true. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, it says, Know ye not that you are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwells in you? God can't get any closer to you than what he is. If you're a Christian, you have a portion of the Spirit of God living in you. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have an overflowing. When Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow living river, living, <laughs> living water, rivers shall flow. There should be so much, there should be so big of an overflowing because of the Spirit of God in you. That we are laborers together with him. We are. He's, he's with us. He is with us. We're not alone. How does a person get saved? What do they actually have to do? What do they have to do in order for God to save them? There's a scripture that, 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 that talks about that, and I'm sure we all know this scripture. It's Romans 8.10. And in Romans 8.10, it says, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, then we shall be saved. What God wants us to do is we confess with our mouth. We speak with our mouth. We use in our brain, and we're, we're submitting our brain to God. This is, and if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, the heart of man is the deepest part of man, the inner you, the real you. If we give the deepest part of a, us to him, then he'll accept that. It's submitting to God everything that you have. If we can get a person to do that, then God will save them. 
If we can get a person to surrender to God, how do we get a person to surrender to God? How do we convince them to do such a thing? What is it that we can possibly say to them to make them do that? We can say, do it. Submit to God. Surrender to God now. Pray to Jesus right now and give him everything that you've got. Tell him you believe in him and you need him now. God, help me and save me. God, help me right now. I can't take it anymore. Tell them something that would get them to plead to God and ask him. That's our job. That's what we're supposed to do. We gave out, I give out these cards. I hope everybody has one. On this card, one side says, let the Bible speak. And the other side, there's five questions and then a scripture. I want to look at these five questions first. These questions are put on this card so that we have an example of how to help lead someone to Christ, how to get into a conversation about that thing. How do we speak to somebody and get into a conversation about Jesus? How do we do it so it's non-confrontational? How do we do it so it's easy, so we don't fear so much? How do we slide into that conversation so that it's simple, easy, and natural? These are some questions that we can use. Jesus was at the well. He told the woman, woman, give me to drink. It was something that was natural and physical at the time. He used that to get into a spiritual conversation. Question number one. Do you have any kind of spiritual belief? It's an easy question, very simple, non-confrontational. You're not telling them you're going to hell. You're saying, do you have any kind of spiritual belief? Please talk to me. Tell me what you think. I care so much about you. I want to hear what you have to say. I'm looking at you. I have compassion on you. I need you to talk to me because I care about you now. You want to follow up that question with something else by saying what led you to believe that? Why do you believe what you believe? Because once you get into the conversation, the ice is broken, the fear goes. Now you have that opportunity to speak to them and tell them the things they do not know about. They don't know about the Spirit of God. They don't know God. You know who He is. You are saved. They are not. They need help and you want to help them. Once you can get into the conversation, things get easy because now you can speak freely. And so can they. Just like the woman at the well, when she began, after the negative things she had to say, Jesus kept going, things got good, she began to speak. They had a, uh, a conversation back and forth about spiritual things. Question number two. To you, who is Jesus? You can ask this question, you can listen to what they say, you're going to find out where they stand spiritually, but you want to listen to them. You care about what they say. Do you believe there is a heaven or a hell? Now you're getting deep into the conversation. You're understanding very much about what they believe and why they believe it. In the middle of the page, you can see a scripture. It's 2 Timothy 2.23. It says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing they do gender strife. But the servant of the Lord must not strive. It means not to quarrel or argue, but be gentle unto all, apt to teach, patient. If they begin to talk to you things and they want to quarrel or argue, go on to something else because that's not what we want. We want to talk to them about spiritual things and get them to speak and tell us what they know. Question number four, if you were to die, where would if you were to die right now, where would, you, where would you go, heaven or hell? If they say heaven, you're going to say why. If you say hell, you're going to ask them why. You want this conversation to go on. You want them to speak because we care about what they have to say. What they have to say is important. We want them to know that. We're not just telling them what we want them to think. We're asking them because now we're in a conversation about spiritual things. Question number five, if what you believe wasn't true, wouldn't you want to know? This question is a good question. It's a question where they can't hardly say no. If what you believe wasn't true, you pretty much, wouldn't you want to know the truth? You pretty much have to say yes, and they're giving you permission to tell them the things that you know that they do not know. They're giving you permission to speak. They're giving you permission to tell them about Jesus. 
in 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26. It says, In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God perhaps will give them repentance through the acknowledgement of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. In meekness we're instructing those. They don't know they oppose themselves. We're praying to God that he would give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. Because if they can begin to listen to the things and believe what you have to tell them, the truth, then God can set them free. Know, free. know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Jesus can on, on the spot give them repentance. And they, will, can acknowledge, they can acknowledge the truth because of the things that you're telling them right there, right now. They don't know that this, the devil can take them captive at his will. They don't understand the spiritual things. They don't really know. You're there to help them, and you're here to help bring them to Christ in some way. On the other side of the card, you don't have to use these questions. You can use these questions. There are other questions to use. If you have better questions, use those, but you need a plan to get into a conversation. Question number one, or number one, this is God loves you. God loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You tell them that God loves them, God wants to help them, God wants to save them, God will help you in any way he possibly can. You want to get that conveyed to them in some possible way. Number two, all are sinners, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You want to tell them that it's the sin in their life that separates all of us from God. It's sin. We're all sinners. There's nobody that is perfect except Jesus. Number three, God's remedy for sin, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. There's only one remedy for sin, and that's Jesus. There's no possible other way. You need to accept Jesus to get that out of the way. Number four, all may be saved now. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come to him. Jesus wants to save everybody, and he wants to save everybody now. Just like he saved us, we want to tell them that. We want them to understand that. Did you get to this point? You've done well. Now, it's time to make a decision. We're going to ask them, would you pray with me? Can I pray with you now? Please pray with me. Convey to them somehow that you want to pray with them. You want them to make a decision that's going to help them for the rest of their lives. You want them, you can tell them, here, take this card and read it out loud and I'll pray with you. Or you can say, repeat after me. I confess to God that I am a sinner and I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins on the cross and was raised from the dead for me. I do now receive and confess him as my personal Savior and I want to live for Jesus with Jesus forever. If you get to this point, you've done well. If they don't want to pray with you, that's okay. You've talked to them and you planted seeds of faith in them and somebody can else next can come along and do and follow through and reap that harvest of that person so that they come to Christ. We want, why do we use scripture? Should we use scripture when we're leading someone to Christ? I'm going to say yes. And there's a reason for that, and it's in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. There's a good reason for it, and it says, it's for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, even piercing and dividing of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow as in a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. For the word of God is quick and powerful. It's not a sword, but if it was a sword, it would be the most sharpest sword there ever was. The word of God penetrates deep, deeper than any sword possibly can. The word of God enters our passions, our sensations, our appetites, our secrets, and our intentions. Any secret that you hold, any intention that you have, it doesn't make any difference. Nothing can be concealed from God. 
And when you speak God's word, the Holy Spirit is there. He's convicting this person of sin in their life immediately, whether we like it or not. That's what takes place. They begin to realize the truths and the things that you're saying. The word of God becomes powerful. They understand it. They know it. Whether they admit it or not, that's what takes place. So if you're leading someone to Christ and you get that opportunity, then do it. I'm saying what you want to do is you want to have a plan. You want to find someone that can help you. It could be a husband or wife. It could be somebody else. But it's good to find someone to help you and get a plan. You want to know some questions that can get them into a into a spiritual conversation so that it's simple, easy, and you can glide right into it so it's not confrontational. You want to know what to do and how to lead someone to Christ because if you get that opportunity, you don't want to fail. You want to be able to get it done. You want to be able to lead them to Christ and help them in the greatest way you possibly could ever help them. What's next? Well, we can't let them go now. You can't just leave them. You've got to help them. Anybody that turns to Christ needs to be able, needs to pray every day and read their Bible so they can continue to grow. We need to invite them to church so they can be with other Christians, so they can help us, so we can help them, teach them, show them. They can look at us. We can look at them. The example can be set. You can bring them to church so they can be taught and preached to and hear things and know us. We can befriend them. What I want to do now is to pray. I want to pray that we receive a burden, that we pray to the Lord of the harvest, just like Jesus said, that we pray for ourselves, that we be used, that the Lord uses us in that harvest. He, we become laborers for him. Let's pray, let's pray right now. Lord Jesus, Lord, we pray to you, the Lord of the harvest. Lord, we pray for laborers. We pray that you send us. We pray that we be those laborers. Lord, we pray that we look upon the people that we know that aren't saved with compassion, just like you did. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the example that you have set. Lord, we pray that we get the opportunity to speak to these people one-on-one. -on -one. We pray, Lord, that the, we get the words and that the Holy Spirit will guide us and show us that it will convict, that we'll know the words to say. Lord, help us with those things to say. Lord, help us overcome our fears. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Thank you.